Okay, good morning. I'm Tammy Phillips and myself and Vicki are going to give a presentation on the Assistance to Firefighters grant. Um, as many of you know, right now the um, application period for AFG is open. Um, applications have to be in by 5 p.m. Eastern time next Friday the 12th. So we're just going to talk a little bit about the grant. If you don't have time to get an application in this year, we're hoping that what you learn from this today will get you prepared for the next application period, which is probably coming in towards the end of this year to the beginning of um, 2022. Next slide. So as I said, my name is Tammy Phillips. I'm a grant management specialist out of FEMA Region 5 in Chicago, and I'm going to tell you right now it's very cold here, so if you don't have the cold, it is headed your way. Um, my partner is Vicki Hansen. She's the fire program specialist lead. Um, I defer to Vicki in many of the questions as she has many years of experience. I've been doing this for three years, but Vicki's been doing it for more than a decade. Next slide, please. So what our objectives is, is to understand what the AFG program is, what the application process is like, what um, tools and resources are out there. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about our new grants management system, FEMA Go, a little bit about how that links with SAMS. And we want to have you get a better understanding of what you need to do to submit a success successful application. It's great following Troy's presentation because he talked about some of the key pieces for a successful application and we're going to continue to build on this. So next slide please. And so we're going to talk about purpose, funding, eligibility, opportunities, what can you apply for, and some of the resources that are out there for you to use. Next slide. So what is the purpose of the AFG program? It's really to enhance the safety of the public and firefighters, but what does this mean for the firefighters? It means that we want 100% of the department's active on-duty members to have personal protective equipment. It means that all the firefighters are trained to national standards. Equipment works. It meets NFPA standards. Firefighters have health and wellness programs to maintain their workforce. This is the purpose of the AFG program. It is to develop your fire department and make sure that you can respond to protect the public. Next slide. So the fiscal year 2020 appropriations, um, our application period is always about a year behind when the appropriations went out. Um, this year, there is 319 million 500,000 available for AFG grants. There is the fire prevention and safety, which is 10% of the assistance to firefighter grant, which is 350, 500,000. So really, if you add that up, because a lot of people ask us, well, AFG had $350 million. Why are you only, you know, granting out 319? It's because of the fire prevention and safety that the 10% of that is set aside. Then there's the other program, which is the Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response to Safer program, which allows um, fire departments to add to their personnel, and that is also $355 million. Next slide. So how does this fund allocated for AFG? Well, AFG is a competitive program. Just to let you know how competitive it is, is last year there was over 20,000 applications submitted. Out of that 20,000, only a little over 1,700 were awarded. Now I know it says 2,000 anticipated awards and that's what they anticipate, but that might be higher or lower depending on what people are asking for and how much their grant amount is. So what we do is we set up different pots. So for example, if you're a career firefighting unit, you have 25% of the pot. If you're a volunteer, you get 25% of the pot. Combination, State Fire Training Academy has up to 3%. Non-affiliated EMSs have 2%. And then there's an open competition of 10% that could be applied to any of those. 
So fire prevention and safety, as I said, that's also 10% of that pot and that's separated out and that's its own application period. So when we talk about career and volunteer and combination, this is to make sure that everybody has an opportunity like competes with like. A rural volunteer fire department may not have the personnel, the um, calls, the um, technical expertise to compete with a career. So we're making sure that those volunteer fire departments are only competing against other volunteer fire departments. Same thing for the combinations, which have volunteers, paid on call, stipend fire departments. They're only competing with other like fire departments combination. And like I said, this is to make sure that there is fairness all around. Next slide. Okay. So who are the eligible applicants? Who can apply for AFG? It's not just anybody. It's career fire departments, volunteer fire departments, combination paid on call fire departments. These can be local fire departments, tribal or territorial. They have non-affiliated emergency medical service. This means that they are an independent ambulance service. They're not controlled by a hospital, a medical service, a medical school, or any other for-profit organization. They are their own service. You also have state fire academies. Each state has a designated fire academy. Each ter territory has a designated fire academy. They're the only ones who are allowed to apply. So if another fire academy applies, but they're not the state's designated academy, they're not an eligible entity. Next slide, please. So there is a match requirement for this grant. It has a cost share. But because we realize that smaller population areas probably do not have the funds that a larger population area would have, they do have a sliding scale for the cost share. So if you are under 20,000, you're a small rural community, you only have to pay 5%. Populations 20,000 to a million, it's 10%. And if you have a population over a million, it's 15%. This must be cash match. It cannot be in kind. So if you have somebody who volunteers to write your grant, that's not an allowable um, cost share. It has to be a cash match. You can overmatch, except when requesting a micro grant, and I'll talk more about micro grants later. However, there is no um, competitiveness with this. It, it doesn't it doesn't mean your application is going to be rated higher than somebody who just matches exactly. So there, there's no advantage to overmatching. You do not need to have the match at the time of application. So let's say you're applying for a grant, you are under the 10%. You know that eventually you're going to have to come up with that 10%, but you don't have to have it at the time of application. Now, as a former grant writer, I recommend that you at least have that match identified or if you are under the um, financial control of a township or a county or a city, make sure that they're well aware what this match is and that maybe you have a letter or something that guarantees that they will provide that 10% match or that 5% or that 15. Um, there have been grants returned because the oversight agency says, well, we didn't know that there was a match. We're not gonna match this. We don't have the money and there. All that hard work went down the drain because there wasn't a commitment by that other entity saying that, yes, we can match this grant. There is a match waiver for impoverished communities. And what does this mean? It's an economic hardship. You have to request it at the time of application. So when you're going through your application, there is a checkbox that says, are you going to request a um, economic hardship waiver? You have to say yes, if you're going to. Now, there are specific conditions that must be met in order for that waiver to apply. 
Um, it's such as what is the rate of unemployment in the community? It needs to be higher than the national or state average. Um, what is the median household income? Do you know, you do you have a high poverty level? I mean, are 80% of your population under um, the national poverty level? Do you have a instable local government? Is your local government because of something such as maybe a factory or a plant that was a major taxpayer closed? Um, you lost 500 jobs. That means you have 500 families leaving the area. You lost your major tax base. Your um, government, local government is cutting back. You're laying off people. That would be something that would um, be part of why you would ask for this economic hardship. The request will include a narrative of the financial history of the community, what austerity measures you're doing to address the hardship, and what is the operational impact. So like I say, it's it, it's not very easy to get, but if you're in that situation, it's worth a try. Next slide, please. So each year, FEMA convenes a panel of fire service professionals to develop the funding priorities. These are where those professionals come from. So you can see that we are working with some very high impact um, people to come up with what are the funding priorities as well as what are the criteria criteria for awarding grants. They also can make recommendations. So let's say last year something was considered a high priority, but this year it is only a medium priority. FEMA does not make these um, decisions arbitrarily. We make these decisions based on the information and the input of the people from this panel. Next slide. So this year, we always tell everybody the first thing you need to do when you're thinking about applying for a grant is to read the Notice of Funding Opportunity, or as we lovingly call it, the NOFO. Read it, read it, read it, because there's always going to be changes. Just because you have done grants for the last 10 years and you've had five successful grants doesn't mean that everything is exactly the same. Things change. Well, anybody who's done the grant in the last couple of years know that we have that new grants management system, FEMA Go. That is a big change. There's also the big change that FEMA Go is linked to SAM.gov, which is the um, database that allows a entity to do business with the federal government. So that's an important component. So those are a couple of the big changes that have happened the last couple of years. So new for this year, so the period of performance for this year is going to be two years. In the past, it's only been one year, but because of the situation with the COVID-19 response, there has been too many delays in the last two years, fiscal year 18, fiscal year 19, they're going to be doing extensions, adding another year. And rather than having to worry about doing that for 2020, they're going to be a two year period of performance. Doesn't mean that there's gonna be a two year period of performance for the 2021 grant. They'll probably look at the situation and make the decision um, before they put that NOFO out. Paid on call stipend departments are now considered combination departments. That was always a question before, and now they clarified it in the NOFO. Seated riding positions, there's a change that affects the reserve vehicles. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, I'm gonna tell you to read. It's somewhere around page 40 to 50. So you need to read the NOFO to find out if that's going to affect your application. Um, integrated thermal imaging cameras are determined ineligible. Um, radio internet protocol, that's now a medium priority. Modifications to facilities, so security systems have been determined are ineligible for the AFG grant. Regional projects, this is a biggie. A regional project, one where one person submits the application for two, three, four, five, six other fire departments, the same vendor must be made for the purchases. So if you're buying SCBA and fire department A and B want this vendor, fire department C wants another vendor and 
by your department D doesn't care, you have to agree on one vendor. So the whole purpose of a regional grant is power through high volume purchase. So by using multiple vendors, you're not getting that advantage. Access funds, you've got a great deal on your PPE. You have money left over. We allow you to spend that money, but it may only be spent on an item that is currently judged to be high priority in that year's NOFO. So if you have extra money and the next item on your list is not considered a high priority for that year, I'm sorry, you cannot spend the money. Before you use excess funds, always reach out to myself or Vic. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Okay, my VPN went out. Okay. So the other thing is, is when you're requesting funds, oh, I went out again. Is it back on? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. You know, that's that's our modern technology. <laughs> Okay, supporting documentation. Um, it's very important that when you request the money, you're going to have to have attachments. And if you're requesting reimbursement, that's going to be the paid invoice and proof of payment. If you're requesting advance payment, that's going to be a um, invoice with an estimated date of delivery. And then once you receive the items, you're going to have to then put proof of payment attached to that request. Next slide, please. So what are our funding opportunities? There's two of them usually, operations and safety activity and vehicle acquisitions. So under the operations and safety activity, you can purchase things like air compressors with equipment, fill stations, portable radios, vehicle exhaust systems, washer, dryers, extractors. Your PPE is the turnout gear, your respiratory gear, your wildfire gear. Training, training to be NFPA standards, firefighter one and two. Um, you, if you have a new vehicle, you can have the driver's training for that new vehicle. Um, training means you can submit for tuition, course fees, travel expenses, and in some cases overtime if you have to have people substitute to allow other people to train. Wellness and fitness, that initial medical exam, cancer screenings, fitness equipment. And under modifications, your source capture exhaust systems, your sprinkler systems, smoke fire detector systems, and then the biggie that everybody is interested in is vehicle acquisitions. So under that, you can see aerials, trunk tankers, um, non-transport EMS, brush trucks. However, read the NOFO carefully. Not all vehicles are high priority for if you're an urban department, suburban, department or rural department. So you have to read the NOFO to see if it's a high priority for your department. Vehicle grants are very, very competitive. Everybody needs a new vehicle. Realize that probably the most likely vehicles to be funded are those who have the oldest or broken down vehicles. Those are gonna be funded first because that's gonna be the highest priority. Next slide, please. So what are the application types? There's actually four of them. So we talked about operations and safety, which were those five activities, your vehicle grant, which are only vehicles, but you also have something called a micro grant. So those are requests that are $50,000 or less in the federal funding for the activity. And what is the advantage of a micro grant is they may receive additional consideration for award and if selected, they are awarded faster. So let's say your department needs just a CBA equipment. And when you look at your application and it's $40,000 total, I would go for a micro grant. Like I said, they're looked at quicker and they're awarded faster if they are eligible. The other one, of course, is the regional grant where you have one organization that acts as a host. They apply on behalf of itself and any number of 
participating AFG eligible organizations. So if the organization is not eligible under the AFG grant, they cannot be part of a regional grant. So the other thing that regional grants is you need to have a memorandum of understanding, and that means that you have agreements with all the other departments um, on how this grant is going to be applied for, and if received, how the funds are going to be expended. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Vicki, and she's going to get into some more details. Thank you, Tammy. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to talk about um, understanding the process. So first there is the notice of funding. That is the document that um, lets you know what is eligible, how to apply, and uh, when they anticipate making awards. So we consider that the Bible of the program. The application period is usually 30 days. This year it's 39, but ordinarily it's just 30 days. There's an electronic pre-score a peer panel review, a post panel review, and then awards. The electronic pre-score is um, scored based on how you answer the questions. The peer panel review are three reviewers that are recommended by the criteria development team that review your application and score it, and then the awards. If you, okay, next slide please. So in the notice of funding, it tells you how this program was authorized, and that is by the Federal Fire Prevention and Control Act of 1974, and our appropriation comes from the Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Act for 2020. The notice also lets you know what the program objectives are. There's priorities of high, medium, and low. The notice also talks about who's eligible. Tammy already went over that with the fire departments. Key dates, such as when the application period opens, when it closes, and when they anticipate uh, making awards, and then when the, the final period of performance will end. It talks about the performance period again. This year it's brand new for two years. And then the terms of the NOFO are incorporated in the terms and conditions of the award. So when you accept an award, you're actually entering into a contract with the federal government, and there's all kinds of terms and conditions. They are listed in the notice of funding, but once you get an award, it'll be in your award package and you need to make sure that you read all that so you know um, what you're responsible for. Next slide, please. So prior to submitting an application, you have to have some prerequisites. So we already, you've already heard about the DUNS number. So you need to have a valid DUNS number. You need to have an employee identification number. That information needs to be in SAM and with a SAM registration. The SAM registration expires every year, so you need to make sure that you keep that updated. And it's in your best interest to know who from your agency is the SAM person, because sometimes those people leave, and then when you go to try to submit an application, you can't get in because the SAM person isn't there to update it, and you don't know who it is, and it turns out to be a mess. So if you're with the fire department, but the SAM is managed by your financial, um, division, make sure you know who that person is. Your organization needs to be registered in FEMA Go. And again, that SAM registration person is usually the one that registers your organization in FEMA Go. And then be sure you to submit the application prior to the um, end date, which is next Friday. Next slide. So again, the application period is 30 days. All applications need to be submitted through the FEMA GO system. In the past, we had allowed paper applications. That is no longer the case. Everything goes through FEMA GO. And then we, had, we have um, determined that it takes about seven hours for each applicant to compile the information needed for the application, and then about another one to two hours to complete the online application. Next slide. So the electronic pre-score. It's your application versus other like application. And the answers that you give are scored based on how you answer those questions. And I'll get into that in a little bit. And then there's the peer panel review where um, three reviewers from the fire service organizations that have been recommended will look at your narrative and they will look for the required information that we provide to you in the notice 
in the notice of funding as well as our guidance documents. So you have to score well on your application narratives in order to be in the competitive range. Next slide, please. So the electronic pre-score is 50% of your score. Each of those questions that you answer in the beginning portion of the application are scored. The majority of them are scored based on how you answer the questions, such as why, what is your reason for a request? What is the condition of the items that you're um, requesting or you know, requesting to replace as well as the age? And then if you score high enough in the electronic pre-score, then you move to the second phase, which is the peer panel review. And those reviewers are given criteria of what to look for in your narratives. So we have guidance documents available to you so you can see exactly what the reviewers are looking for in each of the narrative sections. And then there's a post panel review. So if your application is considered for funding, then FEMA staff looks at the application, looks at what you're purchasing, how much, is it appropriate for your community, a couple other things, and then um, that determines who is going to receive an award. Next slide. So the applications are ranked from the highest score to the lowest. Awards are given out based starting at the highest scoring application and the money is given out, awards are made until that those funds are exhausted based on the congressional mandates and the appropriations. So if you receive the award, you will be notice, notified via the FEMA GO system and you have 30 days to accept that award. If you don't accept in the 30 days, the offer will be withdrawn. So if you anticipate that you can't um, accept that award within 30 days because you have to take it before your council or get approval first, reach out to Tammy or I and let us know and we can make a note on the, on the um, FEMA GO site saying that you do intend to accept the award, but you have to wait for approval. And then if you don't receive an award, you will also be notified through the FEMA GO system. And usually Tammy and I will get some information regarding why your application was not successful, but that is not until after all the awards are made and after the um, turn down notices have been sent out. They also started to offer online webinars after um, the turndowns go out so that maybe you can watch those so you can watch the webinars and see where your application fell short or you can do that or call Tammy or I. Next slide. So program requirements if awarded. So again, this is a contract with the federal government. So during your time of, um, during your period of performance, if you receive the award, you have to report to NIFRS. You have to um, report during your application, or not the application time, during the award period. You don't have to be reporting now, but should you get the award, you have to report then. You also have to adopt the National Incident Management System. You have to have training as well as um, um, adapt that system to use out on the fire ground. The maintenance of effort, that deals with your budget. So you need to have the same uh, budget as you had the prior two years from the time of award so that you're not using federal funds as part of your operating budget. The cost share match, that needs, you need to know that you have that um, requirement. Again, it's not, uh, you don't have to have that in hand at the time of application or if the, or at the time of award, but you have to have your money into the total cost of the project by the end of the period of performance. The lobbying means that you cannot use federal funds to influence um, congressional employees. You need to be sure that the vendor you use is not debarred or suspended from receiving federal funds. You have to have a drug-free workplace policy a non-discrimination policy, and the 2 CFR 200 uniform guidance is the cost principles that deals with procurement guidelines. So we um, are conducting a lot of monitoring on our grantees to make sure that they are following these requirements. If you have any questions, if you receive an award and you have any questions about any of these things, please reach out to Tammy and I. We can supply you with samples for you know procurement policies or um, anything else that you may need. Next slide. 
So again, the FEMA Go is the only place where you can submit an AFG application. Regardless of the program, AFG, Fire Prevention Safety, or SAFER, it all has to go through FEMA Go. Next. So you need to figure out what your need is for your department. So you need to do that risk assessment. So then you need to, so you figure out what your department needs. Then you need to read the notice of funding and you need to read that a couple of times, like Tammy um, said, because there's a lot of information in there and you really need to know what it says. So it's spe specifically, what are you asking for and what kind of priority um, is that item for the program? And then you need to reevaluate re your needs based on what you read in the notice. So sometimes you might be interested in a fireboat. That's what you need or some kind of equipment. Well, then if it's not listed in the notice of funding or if it is in the notice of funding and it's a medium or a low priority, you don't want to ask for that because we don't have enough money to fund medium and low priorities. So then you're going to have to go down to the next item that's a priority for you. And whatever you ask for on this AFG application, make sure that it is a high priority. Next. We have lots of guidance documents. This is our website address. On there, you will find the notice of funding, an application checklist. The checklist um, lists all the required information you need to have on your application. And these documents are usually usually available prior to the application period so you can you know, compile the information. So the checklist has everything you need to have on your application. A narrative get ready guide tells you what um, your narratives need to address. The self-evaluation sheet provides you with the criteria that the peer panel reviewers are using when they do look at your application. There's a cost share calculator because now your, your share is based on the federal share, not the total cost of the project. So a lot of times people call and say, I can't figure this out, it's not right. Well, we have a cost share calculator available that has the formula for you to figure out how much your project is going to be based on the federal share. And then we also have a FEMA Go user guide. So when your SAM person needs to register your department in FEMA Go, we have instructions for them. Next, please. So some important things you need to know. Most of the questions on the application are scored. So if it asks you how many firefighters are trained, how many active firefighters do you have? Um, you know, what is your community type? Do you represent or do you have any critical infrastructure in your community? Hopefully you want to, you have some that you can say yes. It's going to ask, is this going to benefit any other department? You want to say yes, because the more people that this um, project can benefit, the better your application is going to be. You only want to select high priority items with the exception of this year PPE for turnout gear, um, a medium priority is acceptable. The reason for your request is very important. So sometimes um, people will say, well, we just want to update our technology and get you know better air packs. Well, update technology is a low priority. So you don't want to ask for that. If you're starting a new mission, you want to start a dive team and you know you need equipment for that, that would be starting a new mission. That's a medium priority. That's not going to get funded. High priorities is your equipment needs to be replaced because it's not compliant to the current standard. So this is extremely important that your reason for your request. And again, this information is in the notice of funding. And the reason for requests differ between equipment and personal protective equipment. So make sure that you're looking at the right uh, reason for requests for whatever it is that you're asking for. And then the age of the equipment is important too, because we have now um, given lifespan years for the equipment that we fund. So for example, equipment that has a short lifespan is five to seven years. Intermediate lifespan is eight to 14 years and long lifespan is 15 to 20. So if you're looking for um, rip packs, we consider rip packs to be to be an intermediate item. So that's eight to 14 years. So if you have a red pack and it's only like six years old, that's not gonna uh, be given a high priority because it doesn't meet the age criteria. So the um, 
keep that in mind when you're going to replace items and replacing items is better than buying for the first time. And then your narrows are important because they're for 50% of your final score. So not only do you need to be careful on how you answer the questions in the beginning part of the application, you need to do to need to spend um, time writing up those narratives so that you can score well in all of those areas as well. Next, please. So we have funding priorities, high, medium, and low. And again, high priority items are the ones that get funded because there just is not enough money for medium and low priorities. With the exception of the PPE, you can apply for that as a medium priority. Next. So program priorities differ. They differ based on the items funded, the type of community you represent, the reason for your request, and the type of department you have. So for example, pagers are a high priority for rural departments, but it's not, it's a medium and a high, a medium and low priority for suburban and urban areas. Same thing with vehicles. You need to make sure that the type of vehicle that you are re requesting is appropriate for your community type. And you also wanna make sure that you are in the right community category because if you say you're a suburban department but really you're rural you're going to be competing with other suburban departments who are going to have a higher call volume next please and also are you trained in the item that you're asking for if you're not trained and you say you're not asking for training funds and you don't answer yes to the question that you're going to get training from the um, vendor that's going to nix your application. You really need to um, be trained in what you're asking for. And if you don't have that training, then ask for it. Call volume is also taken into consideration. Again, you want to make sure that you're not putting yourself in the wrong community type because your call volume is going to be uh, less than the larger departments. Is the item going to bring you up to standard? You want to say, you know, hopefully say yes, that you're going to bring it up to standard. And will the item have a direct effect on firefighter safety? That's important too. It's about firefighter safety and citizen safety. And then you need to know um, what your what your project is going to entail. So if you're asking for a modification to the facility, is your um, agency or is your building occupied 24/7? You know that's going to be a higher consideration than some some department that just wants the exhaust system when they're only there part time driver training if you do not have a formal driver training program and you're asking for a vehicle you're not going to get the vehicle because you don't have any training so you can always ask for training with your project because training is a high priority for the program so we want you to be trained so ask for training if you need it and then again the age of the item how old is the item so if you're looking for you know a compressor and your compressor is 15 years old um that's a high that would be a higher priority than somebody that's got a 10 year old compressor. OK, next slide, please. So again, review your department um, type so you know your career volunteer combination. That's easy, but the community type is a little bit harder. So in our notice of funding, we describe um, give a definition of what kind of community based on population, stations, you know, water supply. Be sure that that is correct because you don't want to be com competing against different departments that have a much higher call volume because they're larger and you just, you know, think that you should be suburban when really you should be urban. And the, your priority um, for the request. So is it a high, medium or low? Remember, stick to high priority items and high priority reasons for that request. And then additional considerations such as EHP training, um, MOUs. So MOUs, if you're doing a regional project, you have to have that memorandum of understanding signed and done prior to the application submittal. Um, if you're not trained, be sure to ask for training. And then if your project includes EHP, know what an EHP means and say in your narrative sections, yes, our project needs an EHP and we, you know, we are aware of that requirement and we will, you know, submit the EHP should we get awarded. Next, please. So the peer panel review, 
Those three reviewers are recommended by the nine fire service organizations that determine the, cri the criteria for every year. The pairs are assigned to review like applications from your department. So a career is going to review a career application, combination um, firefighter is going to read combination departments. So they're from the like organizations that you are. There are four narrative sections that need to be completed that they are going to be reviewing and look at based on the criteria that we give to them. And each narrative section is scored is 20 is worth 25% of your final score. There is a there is a narrative section that that you are to describe your community. So reviewers are not going to be from the reviewers for your applications in Indiana are not going to be from the Midwest. They'll probably be from, you know, the east or west coast or Hawaii or Alaska because that's just how they do it. They don't make it um, where someone could be familiar with your department that's going to read your application. So they're going to be total strangers. So when you do write up your, your narrative about your um, organization, describe to them what you have in your, in your community. Do you have lakes? Do you have seasonal population? What kind of seasonal population do you have? Remember, this is about um, people too, not only the firefighters, but citizen safety. So when you talk about your, your community, make sure that you explain everything so that you paint a picture of what kind of um, organization you have and what kind of services you provide to them. Next, please. So again, we have a lot of resource documents. Please use this get ready guide for the narratives because that tells you what you need to have in the narrative sections. And then after you use that, when you write your narratives, use the self evaluation sheet because that's the criteria that the reviewers are looking at. So if you can say you meet all the criteria that the reviewers are looking for, there's a good chance your application will be successful. Next, please. OK, so the narratives, the financial need that is usually the weakest narrative on all applications. So you really need to do a good job of explaining why you need federal assistance. You need to talk about your revenue as well as your expenditures. So why is this purchase that you're requesting out of your control? Why can't you buy what it is that you need to buy? So you want to talk about um, if you have any other fundraising attempts, have you tried to do fundraisers? If so, what kind of fundraising activities are you doing and how much money do you get from that? You know, do you bill for service? Does the money go back to the fire department or does it go back to the, you know, city's township or city or townships, you know, general fund? So you really need to be very specific about how much money you bring in and you can actually like say how much money you bring in or what your budget is and then list where your money's going out. So do you have, you know, debts, loans, insurance, personnel costs, you know, vehicle maintenance, training, you know, everything so so that the reviewer has a clear understanding of why you can't buy what it is that you're looking for. Then the other narrative is a project description and budget. So what is the project and how much does it cost? So this is where you need to say we've identified this is a problem we anticipate it to cost this much money. We can get it done within the period of performance. And then the reason why we need this, and then you're going to talk about the condition of your current items that you're looking to replace. So if you have um, worn out turnout gear, you need to talk about the condition of the turnout gear. Just because they all don't match isn't does not suffice getting an award. You have to talk about how, you know, it's worn, torn, tattered, doesn't have prov provide the um, firefighter with adequate, you know, coverage, they're worn, the boots are, you know, the rubber boots are worn out, there's no tread, they slip, which all this needs to tie into firefighter safety. So when you talk about the project description, you're not going to talk about the new items that you're going to get. You're going to talk about the condition of what it is that you need to be that you need to have replaced. And then the cost benefit, how is the project going to benefit your department? So how are you going to be better with by having the new gear? So you're going to talk about, you know, how it's going to be a benefit to your department mission. Is it going to uh, prevent injuries by having 
new boots. You're not going to have slips, better fitted pants. You're not going to trip on them, you know, things like that. What, what is the cost benefit? How is this going to benefit your organization and the community? And then the last is the statement of effect. So how is it going to enhance department effectiveness? Well, you can repeat some of the information from the cost benefits narrative into the statement of effect. So now you have better boots, better pants, it, they're going to be safer on the ground. They're going to be more willing to come out to calls. They're going to do a better job when they go on uh, mutual aid calls. So, you know, you want to tie it in on how this is going to better enhance your productivity as well as, you know, your um, health and safety of the firefighters. Before you submit your application, you want to have somebody read the narratives. Next slide, please. So, have somebody look at the entire application. You're working on it. You know what you're thinking. You know what you're saying. But somebody else um, needs to read that so that they can understand exactly what you're asking for. Have somebody else go through the entire application because the way you answer the questions in the beginning is extremely important. So you want to make sure that you've answered that correctly and you get somebody else's eyes on it because you might understand a question to be one way when it's really not that. So a lot of times people put in their own, you know, personal opinions or own feelings on how they answer the question, but that might not be the right way to answer that question. So have somebody else review the application. If you're using a grant writer, be sure that you review the, the application prior to submittal. I've actually had chiefs call after they received the award and said, yeah, what did we get? I don't know, you know, the grant writer submitted the application and I don't know what we were awarded. Well, you know, or they asked for the wrong item. So as the fire chief, you are responsible for that application. So make sure that the information that is um, provided is first off accurate for your department and the right items that you are actually looking for. And then, be sure to submit the application well in advance from next Friday because everybody gets on and tries to, you know, upload their application on the last day. It bogs the system down and then creates problems and then your application doesn't get in on time and then you don't get funded. Next, please. So if you have any questions, we have some um, people that you can contact. You can call our help desk. You can email our help desk. You can um, go online and look at our frequently asked questions or look at the guidance documents, or you can find out who the regional program specialists are. Well, Tammy, Tammy is the um, point of contact for Indiana, but you can contact anybody, any one of us. If you can't reach Tammy, please call me. If you can't reach me, um, we have a list of everybody nationwide and everybody should give you the same answer. So if you can't reach us, feel free to reach out to another region. Next, please. So that concludes my portion. I um, just really want you to pay attention to how you answer the questions, the reason for your requests. Are there any additional considerations, you know, like if bringing it up to standards? Be sure to talk about how this is going to positively affect um, your firefighters and the community. So. All these things are important, not just the narratives. So that's it. Thank you.